Are you excited to math it up? Yeah, me neither. I'm just tired. <laughs> you work today? Yeah. Where do you work? Uh, integrated well system. So I'm on the phone all day, emailing, texting. That sounds painful. I don't like it. I, you know, I'm your standard nerd. I tend to hate as much social interaction as I get. So the idea of spending my entire day trying to contact people. Hmm. Hmm. That would uh, that would more than be draining to me. I think I'd be dead by the end of an eight-hour shift. I'd be annoyed enough when I was back when I worked at GameStop, and then be like, "All right, new Call of Duty's coming out. Call these two hundred people that have it pre-ordered and give them all the all the crap." Hmm. Yeah, it's me. That's how you know. Very often feel like this meme because I realize that many of much of how I feel throughout my day would be solved with one more hour of sleep. Mm -hmm. But it's just not going to happen. Go to sleep late, wake up early. Good combo. By good combo, it merits a combo. Okay, so. What we're doing today, we're going to review all the exponents and roots and stuff that we did last time. We're going to jump into scientific notation, after which we will play with some units of measurement. Isn't that exciting? Oh, so you're excited? Cool. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. Last time we played around with exponents. Exponents are basically shorthand for repeated multiplication, like I always say. So if I have five to the third power, that is five cubed. I could call it that if I want to. Doesn't much matter, but it means that it's that five multiplied by itself three times. So if I see five with a little three up top, that's three fives multiplied together. Three anything multiplied together. Whatever is hanging out there multiplied by itself. That's a concept of an exponent. And then we played around with multiplying and dividing. And if you remember, since really exponents are shorthand for multiplication, when we're multiplying and dividing uh, exponential terms that have the same base, you can just add the powers across. So, Three to the third times three to the fourth would give you three to the seventh because you have three threes multiplied by four threes. So you have a total of seven threes multiplied together. You're literally just taking them and instead of actually multiplying it out and figuring out what number that would be, you're just cramming them together. It's really what, what you're doing. You're not figuring out what the new number is. You're just, yeah, there's a good way around it. Uh, same thing with division. We have 2 to the 5th over 2 squared. Uh, you can look at that as canceling, or you can look at that as subtraction. Because if I have 5 2s on the top and 2 2s on the bottom, that means that 2 2s are going to cancel out. Right? Because 2 divided by 2 and 2 divided by 2, those are both going to poop. You end up with 3 left on top. That's one way to look at it. Otherwise, you could just do the subtraction. Top power minus the bottom power. It's always going to be that direction, and you end up with what you end up with. Questions so far? All four of you. Then we had this fun one. Exponents with the power outside of them. I know we love the exponents. So when you have this, that's telling you that you have whatever is inside of that parentheses multiplied by itself that many times. Doesn't matter what's in that parentheses. Could be 40 different terms. Could be one giant term. 
could be the number two. I don't care. Whatever you got is to the power outside of it. Now, if you have something with exponents, like we got right here, you're saying, okay, we have that five three times. That's awesome because you just said the word times. We're multiplying. You can get away with just multiplying this. I have five three times. That means I have 15. Not, not too painful. And if I had more terms inside of there, if that term was a to the fifth, b to the third, c to the second, or something like that, every single one of those, you would have to multiply that three onto their powers. Then we had one more concept with exponents, and that was the ones that end up negative. So negative exponents are really annoying to try to wrap your head around. Not a big fan of that. So what I usually tell people to do is if you're not going to use them, because you can just, as long as you're careful about your signs, you can just do like the, the division and the multiplication with negative exponents the same way. You just have to make sure you're keeping it straight with that negative three, for instance. Um, but if you end up at the end of your problem with a negative exponent, in order to turn it in, you got to make it positive. So if you're going to make anything with a negative exponent positive, you have to flip it to the other side of a fraction bar and just change the sign. So if you have two to the negative three, that jumps to the bottom and becomes one over two to the three. If you have one over seven to the negative fifth, then you just flip it up to the top and you have seven to the fifth. You wouldn't need to put over one because anything divided by one is itself. That's all the uh, rehashed concepts. Are we excited about taking all of these at once and cramming them into some problems? Well, it doesn't much matter because we're gonna do it anyway. And we don't honestly have many, so it's not too bad. That is also a very accurate. Fun thing about anxiety, I have a lot of it. And I hate public speaking. You should have seen me the first time I taught a class. The class was full. I was freaking terrified. I took so many of my anxiety meds before I went in. Normally that would drop a horse. Nope. Took the edge off. I even had, um, had one class where I had some students trying to troll me. And I was like, I don't know if that's going to be enough. Because I took an extra one. And he's like, no, no, you should take more. Okay, how many more? Two. Okay. <laughs> they were antihistamines. So it, it was like baby Benadryl. It wasn't going to do anything bad. But it looked dramatic. In fact... The reason antihistamines are prescribed for both colds and for anxiety is because what they're actually doing is they're telling your body, hey, everything's all right. Don't worry about it. It's okay. So if you're sick, it tells your body, yeah, you're fine. You'll be okay. Don't worry about it. If you're anxious, you're good. Don't stress it. Modern medicine. Terrifying when you realize it's all gas and change. Just going to do the first four all at once. 
I don't know why this thing has decided its interface needs to be gigantic today. Oh my God. That max out almost like I have a spotlight on it, but it's not. Right. So, first one we got we got six squared multiplied onto six to the seventh power. Now, I keep stressing it, but parentheses are literally just there to kind of group stuff off. That's it makes sense. That's what they're there for, right? But if you have nothing really acting on them, nothing, there's nothing hanging out out here. Um, there's nothing that's going to change what's inside right now. There is no exponent on it. Um, that's a big one. So this thing is equivalent to this thing. So we can look at it as if it didn't have parentheses, or we could rewrite it without the parentheses. It doesn't matter. Not in the slightest, right? So either way, we have two terms that are multiplied together with exponents. They have the same base. And remember, when we're multiplying terms with the same base with exponents, we just add the powers across, right? So these things, we're just going to have 6 to the power of, hey, you want an extra turn up, extra step? I left too much room. Let's just do that. Hey, we're going to add them. Look at that. Now it's not a waste of space. Love it. We're just going to add those guys, and we get 6 to the ninth power. It's probably gigantic. 10,000, no, or 10,077,696. So I would much rather do this math than play with that. Yeah, 6 to the 7th alone was 279,000 and change. So it was 36 times that. I don't want to deal with that. This is easier. I want to do the easy one. Do the easy one. It makes life easier. It makes everything easier. You're doing easy. All right. Number two over here, we have two to the 16th over two to the 18th. Remember, multiplication, we added. Division, we'll subtract. Now you could also look at this as cancellation and say, oh, 16 and 18, 16 will cancel from here, 16 will cancel from here, and just cut straight to the end. That's fine. If you don't see it, either way, you're going to end up with 16 minus 18, which gives us a negative 2 as a power, right? And we can't circle that and say that's our answer because it has a negative exponent. So how do I deal with the negative exponent? You flip it to the other side of a fraction bar and make it positive on the other side. So we end up with 1 over 2 squared. Since that one's easy, you could always say, OK, 2 squared, that's 4. You could. You don't have to. I'm going to leave everything in exponents anyway. Do it make sense? It do it maybe. Not that one. That one looks fun. Now, one thing I like to say whenever I'm whenever I'm teaching and it comes up is uh, I don't care for teaching the order of operations. And because that is kind of optional. 
Um, so what that would be, remember order of operations at any point, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, and division, addition, and subtraction, M dots. That's the way I learned it. There's a couple of different ways to learn it, but that's the way I did it. And that would tell you, hey, you can do the parentheses first, then the exponents, then any other crap that you got to do after that, right? So the reason I'm covering that is because normally, yes, you would just go ahead and say, okay, I'm going to clean up the inside of this parentheses first. I have one three multiplied onto four threes. Remember, if that happens, you kind of think of like a little phantom one right there. You end up with three to the fifth. And then when you have the power outside of that parentheses, you're going to go ahead and multiply that in. Where do you get the five from? Because we are taking the one three right here and adding it to the four right there. So we're putting these together just like the, the so problem with the one. Why do we put a one there though? Because there's only one three. You don't have to put that one. But if you're looking at the concept of an exponent and you're saying, oh, it's a shorthand for repeated multiplication, right? Mm -hmm. This three to the fourth means I have four threes multiplied together. So if I multiply on one more three, then I just have a total of five threes multiplied together. Yeah, you're just kind of cramming it together. You're not necessarily even really doing math there. You're just kind of taking like things and sticking them together. But I guess it's still math. But it's really not. It's kind of like a lazy shortcut. And then when you have the power outside of the parentheses, you're going to use that and multiply. Because remember, this is saying, oh, I have this thing inside of the parentheses three times. So you just multiply that power onto this power. You end up with three to the 15. Now, if I decided... And no, this isn't necessary, but if I had missed it or been confused or something and understood one concept more than another concept, um, just, as, just as an example, if I had been right here and completely forgot that I could take these two things and mash them together, I completely forgot that. Out my way, mouse. Then, remember last time when we had more than one piece inside of here, I would just take that power and I'd multiply it onto each one individually. And that's how it's going to be if I had variables, if I had multiple terms with different exponents, it would follow that rule. So you might think of, think of that rule before the other one, and you might forget, and you'd be like, "Oh God, you know that that was a horrible mistake." Now I have to now I have to go back and erase all my work, and that's not actually the case, because if you forget that you can put these guys together and you just distribute that three right there, you end up with a multiplication problem again, and right there. you will add the powers and you end up with the same number. So if you make a mistake and miss doing this, you can still make up for it. Doesn't mean you're wrong, just means you went a different direction. And doing it this way is completely against the order of operations. That is, uh, Epimdos. Now we just kind of flipped a couple of them. So we just ignored the order of operations. We did it a different way. Um, the order of operations is a useful tool when you're learning to keep things straight. That's all it is. Um, it is not a stringent rule. It is not a stringent order. I very often uh, if there was a couple of classes that had long, horrifying problems that would take up a whole page of work, and it was literally just, you know, 
all of the order of operations in one problem, and it was designed to teach you how to do it. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. This is how you make your teacher mad. And I would literally start from the bottom and work my way up in reverse. And just completely make them angry. It's great. Because it doesn't actually matter. As long as what you're doing is a valid step, you're good. Not the end of the world. Whatever order you got to play with. Uh, so this one, boy, that kind of looks familiar. Same sort of thing, but we have different bases, right? Got a five on one side and 11 on another. Okay, well, is there any way to put those together? No, no, those just are. Whatever this is, five to the third power, whatever that is multiplied onto 11 squared. I have no idea what that number is. I don't care because I'm not trying to get actual straight numbers out of this, right? So this is going to follow the rule down here where we just distribute that power through. Now, if you can put them together, you can see that conceptually it'd be a little easier, right? Be a little quicker. If you can't put them together, well, it's not the end of the world. And whatever order you got to do things, whatever. So we're just going to multiply that three onto the two. We get six. And the two times two is going to give us a four. And that that is it. That's all we got to play with. That was, it. that was a lot of effort, right? Good. We just, we just squared, let's see how, how terrible of a number is this? We just took the number 15,125 and multiplied it by itself. That's, that's what we got. This thing right here, it's 228 million and change. These are big freaking numbers that we just multiplied a three and a two. Effort. I don't like effort. Cut down the effort. That's where, where exponents come in handy, is cutting down as much effort as possible. And then we have that giant thing. So this thing basically just going to take what you understand about the last couple of problems and cram it together, right? Doesn't have all the concepts, but it's got a good chunk of them. But the nice thing is it's not going to be a nightmare. Now, <clears throat> the thing about complex exponential things like this is that it's basically multiple little problems like number two just stuck together right because you know if you went and sat in a test you would see something like this and you'd be horribly intimidated right well as long as we keep in mind that things with a different base can't go together, like literally number four was basically almost like two little problems put together, right? We literally just multiply the two onto two separate things. Same sort of thing is gonna apply here. I can't put this 
two together with this three together with this A. So the twos are their own thing, the threes are their own thing, and the A's are their own thing. And if you can do each of those individually, you can do this problem. So the main thing, now I'm gonna show you, and this is, it's valid, but I would never do it this way. I'm just gonna kind of deconstruct this so you can see it a little better. Like if I split up this problem as three different little problems, then the thing is you would just be looking at each of those individually and putting them together, right? That's exactly what you'd have to do. So the main thing is, where do you start? Well, we know that when we're dividing exponents, we have to do the top power minus the bottom power, right? Does that look like that's gonna be fun with some of these parentheses? No, right? So, the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of those parentheses by multiplying in the powers. And I'm actually going to go back to writing it this way, just so we know it's all one big ugly problem. But the only things that's, that are going to change are things with exponents outside of parentheses. So this 3 cubed squared, that 2 will multiply onto the 3, and we'll get a 6 on it. Everything else up top is exactly the same. Likewise, on the bottom, everything but the parentheses are going to be the same. We have 2 to the 8 three times. That is 2 to the 24th. And the A is still there. So all we've done is multiply things in, right? Now, yeah, they're in a different order, the 2 and 3 and then 3 and 2, but it doesn't actually matter you can still kind of look at it as if they're pieces, right? So here's the proper way of doing things. If I decided that I was just gonna do basically number two right here, two to the 16th over two to the 18th, we did the subtraction. That's exactly what I'm gonna do on this problem just three times. I have a two, the top power is five, subtract the bottom power, which is 24. I have a three, the top power is six, the bottom power is a negative four. You have to be very careful of that, subtract the negative. And then we have an A, top power is three, Bottom power, it doesn't have one, but we know there's an A, right? So you would say that's one, you subtract one. And again, if that throws you off, anything that's just kind of hanging out, you can always just slap a one on it to keep it straight. Okay. Now you just clean that up. Five minus 24, it's gonna give you a negative 19. You have six minus a negative four, that'll change to a positive. So six plus four, we get a 10. And then the A's, we have three minus one, slap a two on there. All right, so we just took basically six terms and crammed them down to three. Nothing else I can put together. The only thing that stands out is this has a negative exponent. Again, you can't can't finish your problem with a negative exponent. So all we got to do, that thing is going to become positive if I flip it to the bottom of a fraction bar. What's up top? The stuff that was there a second ago anyway. The three to the 10th and a squared. So you see a giant problem like that, 
treat it as treat it like it has three separate problems. We did the twos on their own. We did the threes on their own. And we did the A's on their own. We just happened to, you know, do a little bit of each one every time. Don't try to look at the problems all at once, because if you try to look at that all at once, it's going to go cross-eyed. Right? Isn't that fun? No? I don't think so. So with the three, you're just you're taking that six and changing it the subtraction to an addition? Or I mean the... The uh, negative four, you're turning that positive and adding it? Yep, because you're subtracting a negative. Okay. You take away a debt, you're going up. You get really good at these, you look like a freaking wizard. I can literally just look at that, look at that first step and be like, oh, okay, well, I got five twos here. I got Eight times three, 24 here. So five will cancel here. Five will cancel here. I'd end up with 19 on the bottom. Threes, I got six up here. I got negative four down here. So those are negative four. Jump up here, add to that six. I'd end up with 10 up here. I got three A's here, one down here. One will cancel. I only have to be left with two up here. That is exactly what we got. These are doable with one step if you get good at them. You're not going to like it. We kind of got to do a ton of them before that. What button did I find? Oh, that's the make this thing fall down button. Should I stop playing with it? Yes. Am I going to? What? I got to push. Right. Do we sufficiently hate that? Beautiful. All right. More fun problems. We had roots. Yay. Usually when I covered roots, I would have a picture of the guy from the miniseries roots, but it was lost on most people, so I just stopped doing that. The next generation. All right. Roots. Roots are basically the opposite of exponents. They're actually the inverse of exponents, but probably don't want to play with that. So the symbol above the root is of the radical, and the number inside of that radical symbol is the index. If you don't have one of those, if there's no index there, then it means it's a square root, because that's kind of just the default. If you tried to have a one there, you would make a lot of people angry, and it would mean nothing. The index represents how many of a factor you need before it comes out as even, essentially. So to simplify a root, create a factor tree of the number inside of that radical, and any groups of factors that are equal to that of the index are able, able to be pulled out. So remember, you have a square root, you're looking for two of each factor. Cube root, three of each factor. Fourth root, four of each factor. And that concept scales up to whatever. 37th root, you're looking for 37 of something, right? Oh my God, he made it math problems. Like doing this, it's turning it into algebra. You go from simplifying just to algebra randomly. Did I cover these last time? No, are we gonna do them? Oh yeah.
So right now, we do not have the tools available to us to actually solve number one. We don't. So that's why next to it, it says for this equation, if x equals two, a solution is x equals negative one, a solution. So this would be an exercise in being able to simplify something like this. So something like that, I'm just gonna go ahead and say, okay, yeah, X equals two. How am I gonna verify if it's a solution? You plug it in. And that works for any problem you do. If you are unsure about whether or not what you did was correct, you can take what your solution was, cram it back into the original and see if it spits out something equals something else that is correct. If you get like three equals three, yay, we're good. If you get four equals two, no, we're not good. But in this case, we get the square root of four is equal to two and the square root of four is two, right? Because four is two times two as well as two plus two. So because of that, yes, x equals two does work as an option. We're happy with that. <laughs> now, does x equals negative one give us a correct option? <laughs> so, um, same thing. We're just going to take that negative one, slap it in the x's here. Well, negative one plus two, you got negative one, you add two to it, you get a one. The square root of one, can achieve, but it's one. One to any power is itself. So the root of any power or a root of one, any root of one, 56th root of one is just going to give you a one. Does one equal negative one? Nah. That is that is not the case. So the only one that works out is that x equals two. I once on a test completely forgot how to how to kind of work with stuff like this. And I drove my teacher crazy because it was like a pop quiz that is just thrown at us. And on that problem, you could see me along the side, because he said round to this many digits, along or along the side, just me punching things into my calculator and estimating. Nope, that was too high. Nope, that was too low. That was too high. That was too low. Eventually I got it and I circled it and it got partial because it was like, yes, but this, this, there. Ah, crap. I am far better at math tutoring and teaching math than I was actually taking the class. Got to get into the stuff. Try to show it to other people. It works. So the next one, we do have the tools to solve that. Oh God, how would I do that? Oh no. Well, the fun thing is that, like I said, roots are the opposite of exponents. And the thing about at the roots is that to cancel them out, we actually would use the exponent of whatever the index is. This is a square root. Doesn't have an index, 
So we know it's a square root, right? And that would be two. So if you square both sides, you slap an exponent of two on both sides. The square root of the square disappears. This thing will become just the three X minus five. Just goes away, cancels out. Over on the right, well, we just squared a five. So that's five squared, five times five, 25, right? Okay, this is doable, right? We gotta get that X and solve for it. Bless you, never do it again, ever in your life. I'll be waiting, watching. Holds it back his entire life. 45 years old, three kids, sitting at home, completely forgot everything, sneezes, I bust through the window. Wait. So we add the five to the other side, we cancel that out over here. We have three X left over here, equals 30 over here. I don't want three X's, I want one. So divide off that three. 30 divided by three, you get 10. Our original problem was the square root of 3x minus 5 equals 5. If I kind of redid number 1 where I plugged that in to see if it was a solution, I took that 10 and I threw it in here. 3 times 10, that would be 30, minus 5, 25. Square root of 25 equals 5. Yes, it does. So this does work out. It's more. Now you're having so much fun. It's going to keep going forever. The rest of your lives. You're going to hang out in this room doing that. It's over in a few weeks now. It's going to keep going. I heard them say math over there. I don't know what they're doing. But I know it's not math guys. I'm like sticking my head in there. You guys doing math? You guys want to do some mathematics? Okay, so. This problem, extremely similar to the last problem. But we cannot cancel that square root right away. In order to be able to cancel a square root, it has to be the only thing on that side. Now, technically, kind of like how earlier I said I could ignore the order of operations, technically it could be done. It would be a horrible mess. We are not there yet in terms of multiplication. It would just be an absolute nightmare. So what you always want to do on these types of problems is get that square root alone on one side. So if I add that three that's outside of the square root to the other side, I now have something functionally identical to the last problem. At this point, it is a square root equals something to cancel the square root. We square both sides. On the left, the square cancels the square root. We have 2x minus 1. On the right, we actually have to square the number. 3 squared, 3 times 3, that is a 9. Then we got to get the x alone. Add the one, add the one, 
two X left over here, 10 over here, divide off that two, X is equal to five. Isn't that fun? You guys seem like you're having a lot of fun. Then we have this horrible mess. Look at that horrible mess. Isn't that a beautiful, horrible mess? We're all thinking. Excited. Look at that thing. What the hell are we going to do? Well, you're faced with a problem like this. You don't know what the hell to do. Your first thought would probably be, I got to distribute through everything and I got to combine like terms. And if that's not your first thought, make it your first thought. That's going to be your first thought. Most problems, the more complex you get, your first put, first idea is things that can go together, I'm going to put them together so I don't have to deal with them being spread out like that, right? So the first thing I can see is that I have an X outside of that set of parentheses, and that is going to be a, a, a pain in our butts, right? So the first thing we're going to do, distribute that X into here because we have two terms. It has to multiply onto each one. So when you multiply an X times an X, what do you get? Well, going back to the rules of exponents, how many X's do I have right here? Well, but you know, I kind of have that phantom one hanging out on them, right? If I did X to the one times X to the one, one of them times another one, I now have two of them. So we get an exponent of two on that, X squared. And if you have a variable and you multiply it onto a number, well, the variable is a stand-in for, for a number that we don't know. So if I have negative three times something I don't know, what do you have? I just have negative three of something I don't know, minus three X. So it just multiplies onto it. It just sticks on it. Well, that's it for that set of parentheses. So at this point, I'm just gonna go ahead and rewrite everything else because there's nothing else I could do on that step. I can't see anything else I could get away with, right? Now this step, we could do all kinds of stuff because we are able to add and subtract things from one side to the other side. Now, question is, what the heck are we going to do then, right? Well, if we go back to the last one, the last one, our idea was, hey, in order to get rid of this square root, I had to get it alone on one side so I could square it. If I've been canceling square roots this whole time with squares, it should stand to reason I could cancel squares with square roots. Right now, that is our big problem. We can't play with that. We don't know what the hell to do with a square root, a uh, square, so we can get rid of it with a square root. But I can't do that yet because if I square rooted both sides, all three of these terms would be under a square root. Both of these would be under a square root, and I wouldn't even have a clue where to start. So what we want to do is we want to get this thing alone. That is in our way. So we're gonna isolate it by taking both of these and moving them to the other side. Now, most classes, they'll just 
you know, do one step of add 3x to both sides, clean it up, then do another step of add 51 to both sides and clean it up. I don't want to deal with that. We're going to undo both of them at the same time. You put them under the like term, the one that it'll go together with. And see, these will just cancel out. So all we have left on the left is x squared. On the right, we have whatever the hell is happening. Well, negative 3x plus 3x. I don't have any x's left, right? So these just cancel each other out. I don't know what that x is, but I know if I have negative 3 of it and I add 3 of three of it, they're going to cancel each other out. So that sucker's just gone. Here we have 64. And there we go. Now, at this point, at this point, we're safe to do our square root. But this is where a very annoying rule that we're probably not going to cover again is going to jump in. And it's going to be an important one if you play around with these again in the future. 50-50 on that being likely. But to cancel that square, we are going to square root both sides. The nice thing here is that 64 is a perfect square, right? Now, the annoying thing is that any time you square root a number, and there is a good reason for this, any time you square root a number, you have to add this symbol, the plus or minus. Now, the square root of 64, that would be 8. 8 times 8 is 64. So what the hell is going on with this? Well, what that is, is that's telling us, hey, if I had squared a negative 8, negative times a negative, that would be a positive 64. If I had squared a positive 8, I would obviously get a square root of 64. Right? So, what is happening here is it's taking into account the fact that this x squared could be either a negative or a positive, and it would still work out. Because you'd be squaring a negative, and it would end up the positive number anyway. So it's kind of annoying. We're not going to go through a proof of that, because no. Um, but anytime you square root a number on its own, you add that symbol. Because whenever you have an x squared on a problem, that actually is kind of telling you, hey, that's how many answers this problem has. If I have an x squared, there are going to be two solutions. They might be the same solution. That's, that's its own deal. But it's going to have two solutions. If I had an x cubed, it's going to have three solutions. x to the fourth, four solutions. But this is literally the only case you can find two solutions with one big ugly straight thing. That is a very unique problem. Isn't that fun? Is everybody drained and dead inside now? Cool, because that was all just review. Yes, I made the review new stuff. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> I agree. Already had one nap today. That was scheduled for deep up for my days off being my teaching days this week. This will be next. Who's ready for new stuff? I'm ready. Me too. Hey, look, it's new stuff. Scientific notation. So this is an application of exponents. So the idea here is it's called scientific notation because you are just dealing with really big or really small numbers that you're rounding off. 
Um, the idea would be, hey, if I have 12 followed by 12 zeros, that's going to really suck writing over and over, right? But we figured out while covering exponents that if things are in an exponential form, we can put them, put them together really easily just based on those powers, right? We could deal with gigantic numbers and it wouldn't be too much of a problem. Well, these numbers can be significantly larger. I could make a tiny little thing on my paper that has significantly more, more to it than the number of grains of sand on the planet. I could just write that, right? You make giant freaking numbers. In fact, here's a fun thing. Every time you've ever broken out a hand of cards in a poker game, Statistically, you are the first person to hold that exact hand of cards in that order. There are actually, in a deck of 52 cards, there are more ways that can be arranged than the number of atoms in the universe, in the known universe. Breaks my brain every time I try to think of that, but freaking it's crazy. So, every time we play around with scientific notation, we take a giant number and we're cramming it down to something that we can deal with. So, obviously it has to deal with numbers that have way too many zeros in them that we don't want to deal with. So, what you end up doing is we end up moving the decimal point. And then, you know, if I, if I had to represent 120 with something that was multiplied by 10. I could say it was 12 times 10. Okay, well, if I wanted to represent 1,200, well, I could do the same thing. It's 12 times 100. Well, then the 100 is 10 squared. Uh, 12,000 is 12 times 1,000. 1,000 is 10 cubed. So you can see what's happening is if I'm moving, if I have a larger number, all that would really be happening is the power of 10 is getting bigger. So that's really what you do is we end up taking those digits that matter to us and we're just gonna keep those and then we're gonna have times 10 to whatever power it is that's going to give us the equivalent of our original number. So that also works for tiny numbers because if I divided something by 10, it would be in the point first digits. And if I divided it by 100, it would be the point second digits, et cetera. So that's where the negative exponents come in in scientific notation. It means they're tiny. It means division's happening, essentially. So if I had to write that gigantic thing in scientific notation, so Let's say, for example, for some reason, you didn't want to write 10 zeros over and over in a problem. I know, it's crazy. I personally love writing 10 to 40 zeros at a time, right? Um, so what you would want to do is you would want to get the numbers that matter, which in this case would be 4, 3, and 6, and then we're going to have to move that decimal point over and then account for them. Now the decimal point in scientific notation always has to go after the first digit that matters. So you're never gonna see 12.7 times 10 to the whatever. That's not proper scientific notation. It's always one digit, then the point, whatever else that matters times 10 to a power, every time. So in order to write this in scientific notation, we gotta figure out how many digits that decimal would have to move to get past that four. So you can kind of see what's happening down here on this ugly thing that I've been meaning to uh, recreate for like three years and just haven't. I absolutely just copied this off of a website. I don't care. Um, so it's low resolution and I just zoomed it up. So what you would do is you would take your 
your pen, put it at the decimal where it is now, and you just start jumping digits. You jump a digit, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Right? You do that until you get to the end of where you want to be after that four. Usually what I'll do, I'm not going to write out all of these numbers, but I will write the last one just so I don't have to do it again, just so I can keep it straight. So I would just kind of jump 11 times and write, okay, that was 11. Okay, no problem. So I know I'm going to have 4.36 times 10 to a power. What's that power? Well, it's got to be the 11. It's going to be however many times we jumped. But then you have to make the decision, is this going to be a negative 11 or a positive 11? Negative 11, negatives are when you have a very tiny number, very small. This is obviously a tiny number, right? We're, we're down into the little, little micro numbers here. So anytime you have a tiny number, you have a negative exponent because you're dividing essentially to get to that point. Um, anytime you have a very large number, like on the previous... Um, the previous slide, there was 12 followed by 12 zeros. That would have a positive exponent. Okay. So that's how you would take a number and convert it into scientific notation. But you're also going to find use for converting things out of scientific notation, which is literally just the other way around. So if you're going to convert something back into our regular decimal notation, I don't have a nice fun visual for this one. Um, we would kind of do the exact same thing. 4.2 times 10 to the negative 7. I'm going to go ahead and do that on my notes so you guys have a good visual. So if I had to convert something like this out of scientific notation, first of all, I'm going to make sure I have enough room. This thing has a negative exponent. That tells me this is a tiny number. If I have a tiny number and I'm trying to give, blow it up to the regular one, that decimal is going to have to move in the direction that this thing would be tiny, right? So it moved to the left. So I'm going to make sure I have enough room for however many digits off to the left of this thing. And I'm going to put my pen where the decimal was, and I'm going to undo it. This thing jumped seven times originally to get to this spot, so that's what I'm going to do here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They might say, hey, there's nothing there. Yeah, that's true. But the problem was, this thing was originally a very tiny number. And for it to be a very tiny number, we had a bunch of zeros that we crossed off, essentially, right? So every time we did a jump and there wasn't anything there, that was actually where a zero used to be. Now, rewriting it and putting a zero in front of that decimal point, see, there were six zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, four, two. And that, that is our number. We got it out of scientific notation by doing that jumping thing and then rewriting. Now, I will say there's all kinds of rules for trying to memorize, oh, you go to this direction in this case, this direction in that case, this direction in this case, this direction in that case. I always got very confused by that. That hurt my brain. You have to remember, you go left in one case, right in one case, and then if you go in the other direction, you go left in this case and right in this case. I can't commit that to memory. So what helped me is literally to just think, okay, negative exponent, tiny number. Positive exponent, big number. If I remember you know, which direction that's going to take me, then I'm good. And I know how to write a big number versus writing a small number. So this is the official way of doing things.
and that is specific to uh, you can kind of see what's happening. It's all about converting in and converting out. So when the number is 10 or greater, the decimal point has to move to the left and the power of 10 is positive. You convert back to decimal with large numbers, it moves to the right. When the number is smaller than one, the decimal point has to move to the right, so the power of 10 is negative. Convert back to decimal with small numbers, it moves to the left. That is painful for me. I cannot commit that to memory. That is, you know, I anytime I tried to commit that to memory when I was taking classes on this stuff, I would always get it back. So I really just wrap my head around big number, positive exponent, small number, negative exponent. And I just kind of followed that logically where it would take me. If I'm getting it out of scientific notation, like this last one, that means the decimal is moving in the direction of making it tiny. That's pretty much what was useful, right? That's kind of how I teach it. It makes life easier. I have no idea what's going on in this picture, but I just like space well. I don't know where the hell this is from. I feel like it's even somewhere. only been on a plane a couple of times, and other than the fact that I hate being stuck into a metal cylinder filled with a bunch of people that I would not want to deal with normally, uh, I didn't have a terrible experience. Not a huge fan. Kind of like to have a uh, room to move my arms. And all the Boeings are falling out of the sky, so that's fun. Like, oh my God, what's wrong? People cutting cutting costs. Everything works great when it's well maintained. That's really the end all be all of everything. Everything with moving parts needs to be well maintained or it's going to die. <laughs> but it's cheaper not to. We're going to cut corners. And nobody wants to be that guy. Hey, this thing isn't working. We gotta ground the plane. And that's why a space shuttle exploded decades ago. I remember that. I don't. I actually don't know when that happened. Well, it was years ago. I was like in third grade or something. It was in the 80s. I got I gotta go with it. I'm sorry. Yeah. PhD. That's what happens. Challenger. That was three weeks before I was born. Like pretty much exactly. If I had to pull out a pull out a calendar and looked at those dates, I would have been right there. Cool. It was an omen to show my arrival. All right. <laughs> Here I am. I exist. All right. My life is full of horrible tragedies that happen right before I do something. Like my elementary school, I was always wondering why I wasn't allowed past the tree line. When I grew up, I found out it's because that was the site of the largest school shooting on in American history before Columbine. Mm -hmm. Uh, Stockton, California. A uh, guy went up to the fence and just started shooting at kids. And when when the cop showed up, he just killed himself. Nobody was ever 100% sure why, but the assumption is that it probably has something to do with the Vietnamese immigrants. Uh, I think early 90s. So how did you with the Vietnamese? Yeah. Who was Vietnamese? No, uh, he was just racist. Um, after the Vietnam War, there were tons of Vietnamese immigrants in that area. 
Um, so yeah, he, he, nobody's really sure. He didn't leave a note. He didn't leave some kind of crazy, you know, manifesto like they all have to do nowadays. Yeah. Just, uh, some, just some freaking nutbag, yeah. Uh, January 17th of 1989, 24-year-old Patrick Purdy, who had an extensive criminal history, shot and killed five students and wounded 32 others. The victims were predominantly Southeast Asian refugees. Yeah, like half my school is Vietnamese kids. One thing I've learned in my life that seems bizarrely relevant to today, people do not like immigrants. You ever want to see something really messed up? Go back to World War II history. We turned away boat, boats of, of Jewish people. There were Jewish people trying to make it to America that were just like, nope. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Not <laughs> messed up. Uh, they don't teach you a lot of things. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. All right, so we're going to move a bunch of decimals because I am being derailed men mentally horribly. ADHD is fun. I love it. I hate it. I don't love it. I just hate it. So we're going to take that decimal point. And we're going to get it past that four. We're going to move this into scientific notation. So take your pen, put it at the decimal, start jumping. One, two, three, four, five, six. Don't want to count that again. I'm going to write the six. Okay. 4.352 times 10 to a power. What's our power? Six. Is it negative or is it positive? That's the question. I've said it multiple times. Tiny number. Tiny number is going to be negative. Slap a negative on that power, and we are golden. That is in scientific notation. Not honestly too bad, right? It's dual. Now we got one million two hundred fifty three thousand. How exciting! So this one doesn't have a decimal, but we know where it would be, right? Be right over here. So we put our pen there. And to get this into scientific notation, again, we're going to move however many times to get one, uh, one digit point, the rest of our digits for scientific notation. So we're just going to move one, two, three, four, five, and six. So we have 1.253. Times 10 to the power of 6. Is it positive or negative? Positive. It's kind of a kind of a trick question when a, one with a negative 6 is right above it. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, you ever do that in a math test? Just well, how is this one positive 6 when this number is lower than the one above? Well, see, you're not looking at... Oh, it's the, the zeros. It's the zero. That's yeah, the, it's, okay. It's the direction of the decimal. Yeah. So this one is times 10 to the 6 because it starts off as a very large number. You're multiplying by 10 six times. If I had 1 times 10 six times, you'd be at a million. Uh, the last one, 10 to the negative 6, you uh, remember a negative exponent tells us that if I made it positive, it would flip to the 
bottom for a fraction bar and become a positive number, right? So I'd have, this is basically one over 10 to the six. And if that's one over 10 to the six, I'm basically dividing by 10 six times. So that's why tiny numbers end up with negative exponents, large numbers end up with positives. It's always 10 to out. Always. You never want to have another number there. And the reason it's 10 is just because that's how many possibilities you have in each digit. You, have, you could have 0 through 9. So if I multiply something by 10, it moves over. That's why it's called the decimal system. Deci, 10. Said it before, hexadecimal is awful to work with. I took some computer programming classes and had to deal with hexadecimals. I had 16 things in each possibility. So every digit would go 0 through 9, then A through F. So F, 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 F was 65,536. And I have that memorized because I had to write that crap so many times. But if you started at 0, 65,535. And it always started at zero because computer program. Let's do more. Six, four, two, one, three, zero, two, three. Where's my decimal? You know what? I'm not going to stick with the, not these numbers here. We're going to play with them. How am I going to play with them? Play with where the decimal is. Do that. That looks fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, those ones out there. Right. I just put the decimal after the two and before the three. Well, we played with it a little bit. Now, this is a good example of a problem that you would not convert to scientific notation. It'll work, but do you know why we wouldn't? No zeros. All of these numbers, all of these had stuff that we weren't rounding anything off. There just wasn't anything there. So we were just kind of reframing the numbers. In this case, all of these digits are useful. None of this, none of this needs to be trimmed off, right? Now, if I did put this into scientific notation, I would take a take my pen, same idea. At the decimal, one, two, three, four, five. I did not intend to make it six. It was not my intention to make the answer for all of these have a six on the exponent. But there aren't any digits that I'm getting rid of. What matters? whole freaking thing times 10 to the power of and this was a very large number it was six million and change so it's a positive six did that make my answer not my number easier to work with did it make it easier to look at no neither right so this would be the same number in scientific notation but this is just a problem here to show you hey it's not always useful it's not going to take every big number and every small number and make them easy to deal with. It's just going to make the ones that are either rounded useful or, you know, the ones where they just happen to work out to have a ton of zeros. It's like um, anytime you're looking at populations of countries, there's not exactly this many million people. There's never exactly that many million people. You're rounding off tens of thousands of people. It's like taking Carson City and rounding us all off. We don't count. Based on the amount of digits, kind of don't. That is it in scientific notation. But again, we would never put that in scientific notation. Kind of pointless. 
It's there to make our lives easier, not harder. Conceptually, you can do a lot of things with math. Practically, most of our methods are shortcuts of doing gigantic, horrible possibilities. I only have an associate's. I didn't go on to get my bachelor's. And if I had, I would have had to take a class in math groups. And that, I hear, is an absolute nightmare because there is not a single number in the class. It is all symbols because you are making sure that things work. Why are you making sure that things work? Because we like having rules that work, not rules that don't work. Why can I just be lazy and move the decimal point and count it? Because we proved it worked. So in this case, again, then at the decimal, one, two, three, four. Cool. Now what digits matter? The ones that are zeros that I didn't uh, that I skipped over, those don't matter. These two zeros do because they have a five at the end and that five is important. Now again, I'm gonna have a four here, but since it's a tiny number, negative exponent on that guy. Feel about converting into scientific notation. A lot better than the other one. <laughs> I can do this way. Yeah, I'm going to feel like I can do. Don't worry, it'll get more fun after this. This is just what it is. You got to be able to work with it too. Mm -hmm. Now, converting to decimal. That one's pretty easy. In fact, we already did one when we actually can work with the example, right? Do number five in the interest of time, I might skip number six. So number five, we're getting it out of scientific notation. And remember, that's when we wrote down our digits and filled in some zeros after doing our little jump thing to get it out of there, right? Now for this one, first thing I'm noticing is I have 10 to the fifth, that is a large enough number, right? 10 to the fifth, that is 10 times 10, times 10, times 10, times 10. That's a, that's a good amount of tens, right? This is a big number. If this is a big number, that means this decimal is going to go that way to make sure it looks like a big number, right? So what I usually do, I'll write it without that decimal, I'll put my pen where the decimal is, and I will start jumping five in the direction that I'm thinking it needs to go. There we go. Now, every time I jump a space that doesn't have anything, Yup, fill it in with a zero. Rewrite it without those funky squiggles. Got 131,400, and that's it. So it's a little easier to get out of scientific notation, right? Just got to keep straight when it's big and when it's small. Mm -hmm. Then I'm just going to jump over number six. We'll do number seven. So it looks like it's kind of useless, but it's not. P 
these are the only ones where the whole moving left and right thing is something that I do like to, to remember for fixing scientific notation, just because it's in scientific notation, it's going to stay in scientific notation. And if I'm just fixing it, then I don't have to remember it two different ways. And it's going to be useful. But the question is, well, what do I what do I end up with? What are those rules? They're not written down. No, they're not. They're usually not written down in any particular book. Um, it goes back to the actual rules, the original rules that I didn't commit to memory. Now, the nice thing that's pretty easy to pull off. Because think about it this way. If I was trying to fix the scientific notation, remember, we have to have our decimal after the first digit. So the only thing that's wrong with this scientific notation is that this decimal needs to move, go over here. That's it, right? But that's going to change our power. So if I have to move this one more, what's happening to that power? Well, think about this. This is why I chose something with a small power. Think about if I had gotten this out of scientific notation, one, two, three, and then back into it. One, two, three, four. I'm pulling it back three, and I'm pushing it one, up one more further than it was. What we can do, we can see that that'll, this will now be 6.37 times 10 to the fourth. What we can do is we can kind of commit that to memory and say, oh, okay, so if I'm moving to the left, then I'm going to add to my power. Chances are that's going to work the same uh, the other way around if I'm going to the right, right? But the next problem puts that to the test. Point zero two times ten to the eight. That one's a lot less fun to get out of scientific notation, right? Because getting that out of scientific notation, this has to go eight digits in that direction. I don't like that idea. That's a lot of zeros, right? So I would kind of think of this as, oh yeah, blah, 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 eight, good enough effort, right? Because we would be going back into scientific notation, blah, 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 there's my eight, but it needs to go two more. So, was this? So it needs to go two more to the right. I totally just hit the problem backwards. I'm a terrible teacher. You see what my problem was? Which direction did I go in the first place? I went this way. Yeah. This is a positive. I misread it as a negative. Oops. What I should have done, it's a positive. That means it's a big number. Even though we got a tiny number right here, this power means it's a big number. So I should have gone one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in that direction. That's the direction I should have gone. Now, where does that decimal need to be? It actually needs to be right here, right? After that two. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six. We're moving it to the right, right? So what ends up happening is when you go to the right, you end up subtracting. So it essentially, we added, going in the positive direction eight times, but that was too many. It needed to go in the positive direction six times. You end up with two, and the funny thing is we still kind of have to have that decimal, times 10 to the sixth. 
So we we're pulling it back. We ended up subtracting. Now that these rules are going to work whether or not it is positive or negative. Doesn't matter if that decimal is moving to the left to fix our notation, we're going to add. If it's moving to the right, we are going to subtract. If it moves to the right two, take two off of that. Move to the left one, add one to that. When are we going to use this? Very short. On the next problems. Yeah. So we have converted to scientific notation, we have converted from scientific notation, and we have taken broken notation and fixed it. Now let's multiply them together. Oh man. YouTube formatting. I fixed everything. Going to fix both of the digits and go. Okay, now it's not broken. Okay. Multiplication with scientific notation. It's weird, but we can actually use a lot of the rules that we've been playing with to make it really easy on ourselves. So the main things are the rules of multiplying and dividing exponents and the rules of fixing those scientific notations. Because a lot of times when you multiply or divide these numbers together, you kind of break the notation. So as awful as this looks, if I have 2.3 times 10 to the fifth multiplied onto 9.2 times 10 to the negative 13, as awful as that is, if you remember that every scientific notation number is literally just a number multiplied onto another number. It's two numbers multiplied together. You can take advantage of that because now we don't just have two numbers multiplied together. We kind of have four multi numbers multiplied together, right? And the first thing we ruled out, learned in the class was that if you could, if you had a bunch of things multiplied together, it doesn't matter the order you multiply them. So we're going all the way back to that, those associative and commutative properties. And we're saying, yeah, all this crap's multiplied together. So I'm just going to put together the ones that I want to. So you have these numbers in scientific notation you can get away with, well, if I know that I'm going to keep it in scientific notation, I'm going to put the number parts together, and I'm going to put the 10 to a power parts together, and I'm going to call that good. So you have something like this. You're just going to take the 2.3 and multiply it by the 9.2, and then you're going to take the 10 to the fifth and multiply that onto the 10 to the negative 13. The 2.3 times 9.2 gives us 21.16. 10 to the fifth times 10 to the negative 13, you add the powers, so we get a negative eight. And then from there, you have to fix the scientific notation. It's in the wrong format, 21 point, you gotta move it over one to the left. We're moving to the left, so you add one to the power, negative eight plus one is negative seven. Love it and you know it. Okay, fine. Let's make it a little worse. Here's a uh, division. You're dividing two numbers in scientific notation. The same concept applies. You can take the numbers themselves and divide those, and then take the tens with powers and divide those. In that case, the same as our exponent rules, top power minus bottom power. In this case, we get 0.25 times 10 to the 18th. 
fixing the notation, moving one to the right, it is subtracting one from that power. We have 2.5 times 10 to the 17. Nice and easy, right? Don't worry, it works out okay. Thought that was a very useful meme for this class. One hour here is seven years on Earth. Also, just one of the best movies ever made. I freaking love that movie. No, that one's the, that that one's Interstellar. I would recommend it, obviously. For no one is always the one creatures. Also, a fair amount of science to back up most of the movie. All right. So we're multiplying scientific notation. Doesn't this look fun? It does. It does look fun. The answer is yes. So all you got to do, I'm not even going to rewrite it like I had on the slides. Let's multiply those two numbers together. All right. 5.34 times 2.54. 13.5636. That tells me I'm going to have to fix my scientific notation because I got to move that down to this, right? <laughs> wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. Oh my God, half of my class all young at the same time. <laughs> Technically true, but there's only four of you. <laughs> How many people am I supposed to have? Yeah, you're here. Uh, a lot more. Only 12. I think it's 20. Damn. Oh, so we still on the, the list. Shortness. Yeah, I noticed that. Where was like a full class and now? There were, yeah, there were like <laughs> three or four. Mm -hmm. I'm like 90% sure I saw the, the guy who was dropped in like once or twice and never said a word. I think I saw him in the lobby. Never came in. I walked in out of the He basically went there with me. He was still here. Yeah, he was like 6.40. <laughs> Yeah. Probably had a ride who decided that he needed to do this and he decided he didn't. I've had that happen. You know, my favorite thing I told you about the me getting like heckled and taking my meds and stuff. That kid was actually court ordered to be in my class. He was court ordered to either like serve time or go back to school, which I appreciate. That's actually an option for a lot of people. That's that's great. Something good I can a lot of people couldn't. Uh, well, see, the thing is, he never he never brought in a notebook. He never wrote down a single word the entire class. But like everybody else, he did like a pretest for the class and he had to do a post test. Post test, he didn't try, he just whatever, whatever, you know, basically went out the window. And then they were like, no, 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 you've got to sit down and actually try. He got a skill game, he jumped up. He did better. Didn't even write down a single word the entire class. Just kind of paid attention sometimes. So, like, even if it doesn't make sense, some of this stuff's probably getting stuck in there somewhere. You just got to be able to grab it, which I'm really bad at. My brain doesn't know how to work right. All right. So, we multiplied the numbers together. Nice thing about multiplying these uh, scientific notation parts together, just gonna be times 10 to a power. What's our power? You're multiplying to 10 to something times 10 to something. If I have 10 to something times 10 to something, you're just gonna add the powers. That's it. I got four. Four and a minus five adding together. Oh my God, it's a negative one. You multiply the numbers together, you add the powers together. Then you got to fix the notation. That decimal needs to move one to the left. 
Okay, well, if I have to move one to the left, what did we say about that? Uh oh, I'm going to add. So if I'm moving one to the left, I need to add one to that power. Oh, crap. What happens? What happens when I have negative one plus one, when I have a zero? What is something to the zero power? I don't think we ever covered that. Let's go to Mr. Calculator. That turned off at that exact moment. 10 to the zero. Oh my God, it's one. Look at that, it's a one. Oh, that was a bad. That was too many. Okay. Let's do let's do that. Oh my god, that's a big number. What if I raise that to the zero? Oh my god, it's still one. There's actually a very basic property. Anything to the zero power, it's just one. Anything. Does not matter. I have seen a proof of it. I did not understand it. <laughs> and this is this is after I took calc three and differential equations. I saw a proof of it. No, <laughs> we're not going to go there. But that means that this thing, ten to the zero, is a one. What happens when I have this number multiplied by one? It's just there, right? It's just one of it. So literally one point three five. 636 is in fact all we have. We don't even have a scientific notation. It cleared itself out. Isn't that fun? You're welcome. Yeah, we're going to go straight to eight. <laughs> I'm bad enough at my job and I let everybody go every time. Uh, just seeing a couple of these. No, I'm not going to do all six of them. Just seeing a couple of these. It should be enough. Because looking at them on paper, they look terrifying, but actually doing them, they're, they're not. Because it really just boils down to a couple of steps. Like, I mean, really, look at that last problem. What did what all did we do? We multiplied the numbers together, we added the powers, and then we fixed our notation. When we fix the notation, Damn, that's loud. We do this every semester. The first time I heard it, I started thought I was losing my mind. The morning class is really good. My first time to do class was like bell time in the morning. Same thing. Same thing. Damn. That sucks. Yeah. So all you gotta do with division, this number divided by this number. 1.5 divided by 3.2. Stupid decimal. All right. 0 0.46875. All right. All we got to do with the scientific notation part, we're, we're dividing two numbers that have exponents. Top power minus the bottom power. Be very careful. As usual, I like to say, be very careful when you're subtracting a negative because you're subtracting a negative that is going to change to a positive. So it's 0 0.46875 times 10 to the power of 40 plus 59, 99. But we're not done because this thing, this decimal needs to move one digit to the right. Right, because it's not in scientific notation properly, right? So if I'm moving one to the right, well, we moved one to the left earlier that we added. So if I'm moving one to the right, I'm going to subtract one. We have 4.6875 times 10 to the 19th 
So realistically, all of these problems, all the, the whole slide of them, they're going to be solved exactly the same way every single time. You just multiply or divide the numbers together, multiply or divide the scientific notation parts together, and you fix the notation every time, no exceptions. Normally, obviously, I like giving you a giant horrifying curveball of a problem. I can't. I literally can't in these. The only way I could make these like legitimately harder is if I had a giant complex fraction where I had like one of these problems on top and one of these problems on the bottom, at which point you would just do each part separately. So there's no way I can further complicate this. That is that is it. What do you think? Is it doable? Now the crazy thing, I've actually tried to do it on paper. If you have, we can do multiplication and division, but it's kind of like fractions where fractions adding and subtracting takes more work. If I've tried to add and subtract scientific notation numbers, and it is awful. It is genuinely awful. I even I even put it in one of the classes and like the second I finished it, I think I was halfway through the class. I was like, all right, you guys can go home. They were dead. They were all dead. Speaking of, let's just call it good with those two problems because Yay. they're too loud. Oh, I'm so tired. I wanted to cover a decision problem, okay? Yeah. We don't have time for that, as you said. We have enough time. We have enough time for a few more. <laughs> I'm just not going to make you do it. Okay. I want to go home. I want to eat. I want to fall asleep. Right? I have a movie you to watch. You, don't you have a movie to watch. What movie? Um, reindeer, baby reindeer. Oh, the one on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. I heard that's messed up because it's yeah. real. Yeah, he actually it's wrote a real it story. Yeah, it's based on his own stalker. It's very interesting. You should watch it. will like it'll, it'll be added to my pile of back, back movies. movies. Yeah, yeah. There's so many. See you later, guys. Oh my God, is that what happens when I turn up? Do that thing off.